we are uh, glad that five photographers from different corners of the world with different practices who have been documenting some very personal stories are joining us today. Uh, we hope that with this conversation, we can erase some of the misconceptions about what they have been recording, understand their journey, and re-emphasize why a focus on mental health well-being is very important. Uh, before we begin, I would also like to uh, let the audience know that some of these presentations might contain triggering and sensitive material. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A box and also address it to which of the panelists that question belongs to. And we will take them in the second half of the presentations. Uh, to begin the panel, I would like to start with uh, inviting Salu. Salgu Kusmat is a non-binary photographer based in Sacramento, California. Uh, they are dedicated to decolonizing the field of photography by focusing on stories by and for the people of color and queer community. Over to you, Salgu. Um, sure, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, cool. I can't see anyone, so hopefully uh, it goes okay. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Salgu. Um, I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I identify as non binary. Um, today I'm going to share some work on a project that I did about. Um, gender dysphoria and um, a few self-portraits as well. So a lot of my work, um, as mentioned, focuses on the intersections of mental health, queer identity and faith. And so um, I was really excited to be asked on this panel today because, you know, documenting how um, mental health is an important thing for people is really important to me. So um, this first, I'm going to show a few images from the self-portrait project that I began um, a few years ago when I was first starting to come out and also experiencing some depression and anxiety. And, you know, taking photos for me has always been a really good um, coping mechanism for dealing with um, my own mental health issues. And so, you know, when I started this project, I was just exploring, um, you know, first of all, my feelings of depression, anxiety, sadness, I would have panic attacks and also exploring my identity um, as a queer person and as a non-binary person. And so this first photo, you know, is um, of when I tried on my first tie and for a lot of people trying on different clothes is really one way to explore their gender identity. And so for me, you know, being able to um, try on different clothes that maybe I'd wanted to try or hadn't worn before was really helpful to explore my own identity. I had always known, for example, I didn't like wearing dresses growing up, but um, this was the first time I really was like, okay, I'm not gonna wear any dresses. I'm gonna wear, you know, slacks and, and ties and, um, you know, button ups and things like that. Um, and while I was kind of exploring this new part of my identity at the time, I also had a lot of shame around my um, identity and coming out. There was a lot of fear about, you know, what are people going to think, um, you know, about my new identities. And I think that's a common experience for a lot of folks, which is why it is hard to come out for people because they're worried about what their family or their friends might think or society. And um, as I was doing this project, I was actually um, living abroad at the time and I knew I wanted to go back into photography full time. So I applied to grad school um, back in the United States. Um, I went to grad school in Ohio um, after this project. And um, while I was in grad school, I started this new project called Documenting Dysphoria. Um, and this project is about an experience that's really important to transgender and non-binary people, um, which is gender dysphoria. And so if you're not familiar with what gender dysphoria is, I'm just gonna read a quick definition. So gender dysphoria 
is um, the distress a person experiences as a result of the disconnect between their internal gender identity and the sex or gender that they were assigned at birth. So for a lot of people, you know, when they're born, the doctor usually says, you know, oh, it's a boy, oh, it's a girl. And those are kind of the main two choices in our current society. But there are people that identify um, different parts of the gender expression, gender spectrum. And, you know, as they grow up, they might realize that their gender that they identify with is not what the doctor declared when they were born. And so, um, that feeling of that disconnect is often what lets people know that maybe there's something else going on or they have another identity. And um, so I really wanted to explore what that gender dysphoria feeling felt like for people who experienced it. Um, Cause I know myself, I hadn't come across that term growing up. So I did come out later in life as non-binary. Uh, I didn't know what non-binary was when I was growing up. And so, you know, just to bring some awareness of what that feeling is and what some of these different gender identities are so that people can see themselves represented um, in some photography work. So um, with that feeling, that's the theme of the project. And so what I did is um, asked different people, I interviewed them and asked about their experiences about, you know, when they felt that feeling, you know, what it felt like for them. And we would create a photograph um, to illustrate that feeling. Um, sometimes the photos are kind of metaphorical, sometimes they're literal, um, but they're just meant to sort of illustrate what that feeling feels like. And it's um, shown along with some text from their interviews. And so I'm just going to show a few images and read an excerpt of what they had to say about their own experience. So this first person is um, Megan and she uses she, her, hers pronouns. And um, so she described gender dysphoria as this. First picture in your mind, someone you dislike. Then imagine tomorrow when you wake up, every single person on the planet insists you have to act just like them. You have to dress like them. You have to like the types of movies and TV shows they like. You have to read the kind of stuff they do. And all the stuff that you don't want to do, you are absolutely not allowed to do it without being extremely ridiculed, mocked, and ostracized by society. That's basically how it feels to suffer dysphoria. So this is her definition of, you know, what it feels like for her. And I just want to make a note that it is a different for different people. You know, a lot of people have similar experiences, but different people and different um, folks on the gender spectrum might feel gender dysphoria a little bit differently than other people. Um, in fact, some people might who identify as transgender or non-binary might not feel gender dysphoria. Um, but um, this is just her definition. And, you know, with that kind of on our theme about mental health is like the feeling itself is not comfortable. It's kind of um, a distress or a disconnect. And so, you know, that feeling um, not being able to either transition into the gender they are um, feel that there is, is their true identity can cause, you know, mental health issues like depression or anxiety. Um, and also like, even when they do transition, um, you know, sometimes society is not very accepting and that stigma and that discrimination can also cause mental health issues like depression and anxiety. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot that can be affected here. Um, this is Cricket. She uses she, her, hers pronouns. She described an experience growing up when she was a kid, um, you know, playing with some kids in the neighborhood. And she says she didn't really fit in with either the boys or the girls. And she said, I remember going over to the other side of the street, sitting on the bridge, overlooking the brook at, that fed the lake and just wondering, what am I? Am I an alien? I was about five. This is Taylor who uses he, him, his pronouns. He says, I think the visibility of transgender people is incredibly important. Without it, I probably would never have come out and I wouldn't have had the multitude of opportunities I do now. And so I think this kind of just speaks a little bit to why I'm doing this project is, as I mentioned, you know, I didn't know about these identities earlier in life. And, you know, just by being able to see other people and hear other stories, you can you can see experiences that might relate to you if you do identify with these identities and you're like, oh, I feel that too. Maybe that explains why I have this feeling and that can be very eye-opening for people. 
Um, this is Mari who uses they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, they said, you know, going to doctors and getting really any kind of physical or body exam is definitely a time when I've experienced a lot of dysphoria. In my case, for some reason, I can never go to these appointments without crying somehow. And for Mari, who identifies as intersex and also non-binary, you know, it, a lot of that discomfort from the doctor's office comes from the doctor not recognizing their identity, you know, especially if they're being misgendered or their pronouns aren't being used at those appointments. You know, the fact that the doctor doesn't you know, recognize their identity can be um, distressing. Um, this is Skylar, who uses she, her, her pronouns. Skylar says, I really wanted to be a mother and have that physical and emotional connection with my child. Because I can't have that, it's devastating. So she said, you know, at times she experiences gender dysphoria is seeing all her friends around this time, you know, having baby showers and having babies and not being able to have her own child. Um, this is Danny who uses um, he and they pronouns, describes a dis experience going to the bathroom. So he says, I got hit with a purse once and I was like, I'm just trying to pee because she thought I was a boy. I was like, that's fair, but where am I supposed to pee? And this is, you know, a common experience people have um, who identify as trans and non-binary. They might have anxiety going to the bathroom because they're worried about you know, someone might either say something rude to them or, um, or even, you know, be physically violent towards them if they think that person doesn't belong in the bathroom. But really, like, you know, mostly when you're going to the bathroom, you really just want to go to the bathroom. And so it's, 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 um, it's annoying that you have to feel anxious, you know, every time you enter a bathroom. Um, this is JD, who uses he, him, his pronouns. Um, he says, what comes to mind is a strong feeling of disorientation, seeing an offset image or looking in parts of a fragmented mirror and seeing someone else's body reflected. My brain goes to experiencing dysphoria when being dis misgendered. Just hearing a pronoun, it can feel completely out of left field. So what JD is describing is when someone uses the wrong pronoun for him. So he uses he pronouns, but if someone were to use she pronouns for him, that would feel very um, not correct to him and it would it would trigger kind of this feeling of you know dis uh, disorientation um, and so I think that's also common for people you know when they are misgendered which means you're you're using the wrong pronoun or or um, terminology for someone around their gender you know it can be very hurtful um, okay this is Brit who uses they them theirs pronouns and they Describe gender dysphoria as this. It's like a slow drill or like a dull vibration that's always there. It's that ever present kind of dull refrigerator hum that I never bothered to investigate and was just told, well, yeah, the refrigerator hum, that's just a sound you're used to. I absolutely have moments of gender euphoria where I don't hear the hum. And so I think um, that was a really um, good metaphor for gender dysphoria is like, I know for me personally, you know, before I realized what that term was, you know, it's like there's just this dull, dull unease, but I never knew what that was, you know, previously. And for a lot of people, they might feel this dull unease, but they might not have the words for it or they might not know exactly what it is. And so um, that can be, you know, that can be hard for people because they feel not good, but they don't know why. And so finding the term gender dysphoria or finding the term transgender or non-binary or any other gender on the gender spectrum can be very um, liberating for people once they realize why they've been having those feelings throughout their lives. Um, here is um, Valerie who uses she, her, hers pronouns. Um, she says, it's like every time I have switched one undergarment I have from a men's undergarment to a woman's undergarment, I just feel more secure in myself and more comfortable with myself. And I think um, this is definitely a common experience for people, you know, being able to wear the clothes that they feel affirms their identity can be very affirming. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I wore a tie for the first time, you know, that I felt a sense of gender euphoria that um, just being able to try that on was really liberating. Um, this is Mira who uses she, her, hers pronouns. 
Um, Mira says, I'm a binary transgender woman. So for me, there's the social dysphoria and the body dysphoria. Those are really the two components. I've noticed, at least in my experience, that one or the other is stronger in different people. Um, so for Mira, so what she's describing is there's, there's often these two types of gender dysphoria that people feel. And one is body dysphoria, which is, you know, discomfort with your own body. Um, and then social dysphoria, which is discomfort with um, how society perceives you. So an example of social dysphoria is like when you're misgendered or someone uses the wrong pronouns for you or calls you miss or sir incorrectly. Um, it could be, you know, your family or your friends not using your chosen name if you if you decided to change your name um, or it could be people not um, you know being rude or um, discriminating against you because they can kind of tell that you are transgender and so they're discriminating against you so all these things that have to do with society and how society perceives you would be under the umbrella of social dysphoria whereas body dysphoria has to do with your own body and that is what um, leads some people to have gender affirmation surgery when they you know have have surgery on different body parts. Um, but again, not everyone chooses to go through surgery um, or they might not experience you know, body dysphoria as much as social dysphoria or vice versa. Okay, this is Delphine um, who uses they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, and Delphine, you know, was the LGBT center director at my college where I did this project. And so I asked them, what are some examples of types of situations where you are more aware of gender dysphoria? And they said, when it comes to what does it mean to dress professionally? What does it mean to enter into spaces where there are very rigid gender norms, especially around professional dress? And so, you know, they, they, um, they would often wear, you know, skirts and things on campus and they are more visibly read as male, even though they identify as non-binary. And so, you know, not everyone is comfortable with that. And so sometimes they wouldn't maybe feel comfortable wearing that to campus. And they gave an example kind of, you know, as a joke that they had to go to sort of a black tie event. And, um, you know, Delphine said, they said I had to wear a tie but they didn't say what I had to wear a tie with. And so um, they gave this example of an outfit they wore to a wedding where they wore a beautiful ba ball gown, but with a tie and, um, you know, a button up shirt. And so I thought it was a very elegant example of, you know, what does it mean to really have professional dress? Um, this is B who uses the they and he pronouns. And B says, you know, I asked B, what do you hope people come to understand through these images? And they said the idea that trans doesn't look a certain way and that it's expressed in so many ways. Um, and so I think that's just an example of um, why I'm doing this project. Again, as I mentioned before, you know, this feeling is, you know, a lot of folks have this feeling, gender dysphoria, but they might feel it in different ways. Um, there are a lot of similarities, you know, in how people experience it, but, you know, everyone has their own experience. And, and then everyone who does have that experience doesn't identify with the same gender identity. Some people identify as transgender and some people identify as non-binary or agender or maybe somewhere else on the gender um, spectrum. And so there's just such a diverse set of experiences with both um, how they express their gender and how they feel this feeling. Um, but through this project, I just want to show, you know, all these different ways, because as I said, you know, if somebody sees this and they connect with this and they are able to come to realize their own identity, that's, that can be really powerful. Um, and it's also good for folks to see this project, I think, who are not part of the LGBT community or the trans community, because they have a chance to learn, you know, a little bit about what that feeling is like. And especially in our society, it's so stigmatized to be um, transgender or to be non-binary because people don't understand what that means. And so, you know, people discriminate and people can be rude in, in public. And, you know, even there's like, um, laws and things that can be discriminatory like for example the you know our current president tried to make it so that trans women were not allowed to go to homeless shelters or you know make it harder for trans people to get um, insurance coverage medical insurance coverage um, and so there's always 
you know, kind of setbacks towards or discrimination against this particular community because, you know, because they aren't understood and hopefully this project kind of helps um, them be a little bit more understood. Um, so yeah, so yeah, this is just um, my artist statement to wrap up. Um, again, I said these images are intended to affirm and offer visibility to the trans and non-binary experience from a queer lens. First and foremost, this project is for the trans community, for us to hear and see fellow trans people's stories, for us to recognize parts of ourselves in the experiences of others. Ultimately, it is to empower us to embrace our own skin. For everyone who's trans, non-binary, or gender non-conforming, or questioning the gender identity, this project is for you. Um, and just to wrap up, this is where you can find me. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, and there's my website and my email. So if you have any questions or just want to follow um, my work, um, please do um, follow. And I think that's about my time. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Thank you, everyone. That was, that was very good, Salgu. Thank you. I just, you know, it's so... Um, like it's so difficult to see how so many things that we take for granted is such a struggle for certain people you know something like a clothing that you wear to an event or something where you have to use the bathroom those are basic human needs and to see that people are you know uh, being stopped from getting access to insurance all of that how do you think how much of an impact do you think society's perception of this transgender and non-binary identities affects our mental health? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that um, there's kind of two parts. There's the, you know, the feeling itself, gender dysphoria can be, can be uncomfortable or distressing. And so that can cause some, you know, mental health issues like depression or anxiety, not being able to you know, know what that feeling is or not being able to transition for some individuals. But then there's a societal impact, like, you know, people who do experience gender dysphoria and then they do decide to, you know, maybe come out to their family and friends or to transition, whether medically or socially, you know, if society doesn't accept them, especially their friends and family, that can really impact them. You know, a lot of a lot more, there's a higher rate of suicide, for example, among transgender people compared to the general public because, um, you know, they generally aren't always accepted by their friends and family. And that number, you know, for the suicide number is lower for people that are accepted by their friends and family. So like, you know, just acceptance from the people around you is obviously going to make a big impact on your mental health. And if you aren't accepted, not only do you have to deal with being not infected not accepted by maybe your friends or family so you lose a relationship but also you have to deal with discrimination so like like I said there's insurance discrimination there's housing discrimination there's job discrimination um, and like you know even not just discrimination but I would I would say like violence as well against the trans community like um, especially trans women and especially black trans women are murdered at you know very high rates and that's, that's, you know, obviously very detrimental to the community because there's a lot of fear there too about how they're going to be accepted. And if someone doesn't accept them, it could potentially lead to them losing their life. Like that's a lot to handle. So, you know, the mental health does suffer. Like I would say almost more because society doesn't accept them than the, than the experience itself, because, you know, a lot of, some people even say that gender dysphoria, you know, is kind of, um, they don't like that term necessarily because it kind of pathologizes what it means to be trans and some, you know, psychiatrists or some um, tr um, trans people think gender dysphoria itself is more a society issue than an individual issue. It's like more like the fact that because society doesn't accept you, you feel those feelings of like disconnect and dis-ease because if you were in a society and there are some cultures that do have like a third gender or, you know, a different, you um, um, you know, they're more accepting of different gender identities. And so maybe if you were born into that culture or that time period where that was more accepted that there were just different genders, then maybe you would have a lot less issues or a lot less yeah. um, discomfort and disease growing up. So a lot of it is tied more to society 
than, you know, the experience itself. And so my only advice is to anyone, you know, if you do know someone who's trans or LGBT and they come out to you, whether it's a friend or family or colleague, or just like someone you see on the street is like to be as accepting and open as possible. And, you know, if you mess up, that's okay, but just try your best to learn, you know, try to learn their name or their pronouns or, you know, the, the, um, the appropriate things to ask yeah. or say, or not ask or say. So that's my advice to people. If you want to help this community, you know, be accepted and, and reduce the stigma is just accept those around you in your community. That's a one. That's a wonderful thing. And uh, we have shared uh, Salgu's Instagram account on the chat box. Uh, if anybody would like to reach out, uh, please, please do so. Um, so uh, next, uh, moving on, I'd like to invite Mithil. Uh, Mithil Kajaria is an architect, photo artist and curator based out of Ahmedabad. Uh, the primary themes of his work are the explanation of uh, architecture and its relation to the city. And uh, for the last 10 years, he has been documenting his personal journey. And uh, today he's sharing some from his personal archives. Over to you, Mithil. Hi, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be a part of this panel and especially a little more excited about the subject that we are talking about today. Uh, before I begin showing my work, a little personal anecdote about uh, mental health was last year, there was in a really bad state and there was so much frustration that I had about the ignorance, uh, not just Indian, just society has about mental health. And uh, now after the pandemic has hit the world and I've been talking to people all across and you just realize, you see people acknowledging more than more how important mental uh, wellness is. And I see people who are in a state of being unaware of what is happening with them. Why are they feeling this anxious? And something I had, I have passed through about 10 years ago. Uh, so my work is called Life of a Bipolar. I'm going to quickly share my screen. Is it uh, visible? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run us run this on the slideshow and uh, I'm going to speak parallelly. Uh, so I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder about 13 years ago in my late teens and uh, at the risk of, you know, repeating uh, what bipolar disorder is for people who know, I'm just going to read it aloud what uh, Google uh, shares what it is. Uh, it says it's a mental illness marked by extreme shifts in mood. Symptoms can include an extremely elevated mood called mania. They can also include episodes of depression. Bipolar disorder is also known as bipolar disease or manic depression. So I just want you to keep this last line in mind and we'll uh, return to it soon. Uh, so going back to this work, I was I was uh, diagnosed, you know, uh, medically with this disorder in 2007. The first few years just go about one, trying to understand what that means. Two, trying to understand how to navigate yourself through this society because uh, I'm talking about 2007 and the amount of awareness that I see around right now, I wish so hard, I wish so much it was you know, even one tenth of it was there back then. Uh, and, you know, to continue what uh, Salgu mentioned, large part of these issues are very less individualistic, very less personal, but so much of it is because of the society that we uh, live in and the stigma that surrounds mental health. Uh, so this was never intended to be a work. This began, this particular collection began in 2016 when I was given a prompt of uh, working on archives. And uh, to give you a little context, I had sort of moved cities uh, two years before, about 2014. I had changed careers. I had moved from architecture to pursuing photography. And, uh, and I was not in a great state. Uh, 
I had moved careers and there was that pressure of, you know, trying to prove yourself into photography, but I was barely photographing. I was in a, I would say in a space where I was unable to answer the question of why uh, do I photograph? What no difference is going to make? Uh, why does one photograph? So that had sort of reduced the amount of the number of photos I made uh, that had reduced that had taken away the clarity about why I wanted to photograph and which led to me picking up the camera only when I felt instinctively and I would just pick up the camera, go around across walking, the, walking across the city and photograph. And these were not images that I then, when I was, you know, when I had a certain understanding of photography, these were not photograph, photographs that I would you know, want to share. So having built that over the years and when in 2016, I sat down with all the images that I had from about six years, I started to see a pattern. And uh, that's when this began, which uh, I would say it's a, you know, these images represent somehow, at least for me, the way these take me to the way I might have been feeling when I took that picture. It's very less about the visual for me. It's about, it, it's a time capsule that takes me back to what I was uh, experiencing in it. A lot of these images are just fear. A lot of these images are, uh, I mean, they're still triggers. A lot of them are something that takes you to a state of peace that I might have felt when I had taken these. Uh, and again, 2016, I worked on this a little bit. I left it alone. And only this year, earlier this year, I picked it up again. And then this time I got delved into it a little more uh, rigorously. I went through my journals that I had written. When I say this work is based on personal archives, I want to define what personal archives mean. These are not photographs uh, taken over the 10 years with my camera. I, I went through photographs taken from the cell phone. I had went through the screenshots I might have taken across these years, my personal journals, books I read and things I underlined. So to you know, put it maybe in a slightly more coherent way, this is, uh, you know, if I were to not be around, if someone was to get their hands on these things, these are the, this is the content based on which they'd be able to uh, gauge what my life was like. And uh, so that's what personal archives meant for me. And eventually going through all of these, I was able to build a pattern as to what part of the year uh, are do I have my highs? What part of the year do I have my lows? How much of it is actually just neurological? How much of it is uh, brain chemicals and how much of it is just external situations that you are in? Uh, how much of it is just the amount of pressure that you face in life, the amount of grief that you have because someone has passed on, uh, the amount of grief you have because something really triggering is happening somewhere around you. So that is what uh, sort of prompted me to then, you know, make this uh, work as it is right now. And uh, I think I'd like to talk also a little bit more about uh, just the general understanding of mental health that we have in the society. Um, I want to read another definition of this thing and I want to, yeah. So the extension of you know, what bipolar disorder means is it says it causes unusual shifts in mood, energy, activity levels, concentration, and the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, I, I was a part of last week's uh, session on mental health. And this one question that kept coming back to me throughout that session was the question of othering. How, who do you really recognize as someone who's suffering through, you know, a, a mental disease, a, a mental disorder? Uh, I believe all of us at some point in our lives, much more often than at some point in our lives, have felt something anxiety. All of us have felt this uh, helplessness of unable to being getting up off the bed. And 
not being able to go to work simple tasks like you know just getting through the day so what differentiates uh how do you tag someone suffering from something and why is not mental wellness a part of everyone's vocabulary everyone's life do we we don't see as a this much amount of stigma for physical health as much as we see for this uh and so i think you know i might sound uh, a little blabbering throughout this but these are there's just so many number of thoughts that i have that are crossing through my thought my brain right now uh yeah i think what i intend to do with this work is just i want to put it out there uh, not expecting anything the only hope i have when people see this work is if they can relate to it in any form in any way uh, i don't want uh, people to feel sympathy towards definitely not towards me but towards anyone who they feel has a mental illness or who has a mental illness uh, these categories these categorizations this nomenclature for me is only necessary when you have to sort of only necessary medically i don't think these tags at least for me they don't mean anything more than uh something i'm diagnosed with it's not my life i don't make this uh, this doesn't lead my life uh, uh yeah and i think i if there's any questions if you have any uh if you want to ask anything from priya or any other panelists or anyone else i I'd, i'd be open to answering that right now or we can just go ahead and do it at the end of the presentation uh yeah that's all yeah um you know you mentioned that your work is like a journal of sorts you know that you have recorded all of thing all of these things that has happened in your life like you know the highs when it, it was instinctive that you have taken these screenshots and whatever how much of that have you looked back and seen how much your life has changed or you know like what have you discovered about yourself how do you think this work has made you understand you more or has it you know has it made a difference it uh, absolutely has uh how i mean this is literally you know when you're excited about something that you uh, heard about there's something that has happened in history say I recently watched the trial of the chicago 7 and after i watched the movie i went back to looking at archival footage reading about these things so it's very similar to this uh i can actually see myself changing uh through the notes i might have written in the journal through these images that i might have made and then there's also a cross connection between all of this so if i have say a journey a journal entry from 12 december 2010 and i go back to the images that i had made on that day and that's just a huge database for me to very uh, very i don't know uh coherently track my journey how it has been uh, through this and i mean you know if that is the take away that i take from this project that's more than sufficient for me more than it being a photo project more than anyone else seeing from this and learning anything or just getting anything It's, it's wonderful it's like it's your own personal record or something like that yeah great uh, i just like to remind everyone uh, if you have any questions for the panelists please put it in the q and a box and uh, we'll get to them later um okay our next uh, panelist is anita Anita Satyam is a photographer based in Chennai in 2019 she was diagnosed with cancer after this incident uh, she took up photography as a serious uh, documentary practice as opposed to just a hobby uh, 3 years ago she connected with this uh, person called Nitya and she has been documenting her life also and uh, now she'll present yeah 
Anita? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi, Anita. Yeah. Can I start? Can I start my screen? Yeah. Um, right. Do you Do you want to present, or I'll ask Shuchi to present the screen? Yeah. Um, I'll I'll try it. Huh? I'll try it. Yeah. So I'm having that problem again. I'm having that problem again. So I don't know okay, no problem. Uh, Shuchi will share her screen. Shuchi? Yes, I'm just sharing. Yeah. Uh, can she stop sharing, Priya? Uh, she has. I'm seeing your screen right now. Okay. Can I start? Yes, Anita. Uh, but the pictures, uh, pictures is not uh, clear, huh? Uh, it seems clear to me. Is it not clear, Priya? It is. I can hear you, Anita. Please stop. Oh, the photographs. It's displaying it's okay. properly to me. Uh, are you? Is everybody able to see it well? Uh, no, no she can see the. I Sorry. can only see the icons, not the images, not the full screen. Okay, because here it's loaded fully. I'll just share it again. I don't know why this is happening. Are you able to see it now? No, no, Shuchi. Um, Okay, because it's opening fully on my screen. Uh, uh, Shuchi, when you are yes. sharing your screen, you might want to uh, select the entire desktop. Try doing that. Okay, uh, it, should, it should be on desktop. Wait, I'll just try it. Uh, Anita, just hold on a second. Yeah. I think now we can see. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Go ahead, Anita. So, hi, hello. Um, so, so, Priya has introduced me. Um, so, I start with my myself. Yes, and Anita. I, yeah, please. Yeah. So, I was diagnosed. I was I was having that symptoms of cancer cells, um, the stage zero stage. So, I somehow I cured it. But I have that problems that depression still it's going on. So, so in the world, uh, they actually world, uh, most of seventy to eighty percent people um, are dealing with the problem of uh, thinking, uh, paying attention, or uh, remembering uh, things. Uh, if uh, actually they are actually they are suffering from the mental health issues or. Uh, getting uh, treated with uh, cancer, cancer treatment. So some uh, one third of people still have this treatment, um, and uh, and I am the one who is having this problem of uh, repeatedly speaking the words, or uh, most of time I go blank of the word. So please, uh, if it happens, just ignore it. No problem, Anita. Please, yeah, please start. Okay, I'll start it. Um, so I'll start with a small quote. In the darkest time of your life, a small hope is something you give yourself. Uh, it may be the hope of uh, love or to be loved. It may be the hope of uh, care or to be cared. The hope of happiness or to be happy or the hope of standing beside the person. The cancer patient, whatever it happens, this, this small hope will create a magic in those patients who deals with the depression, 
uh, loneliness, sadness, and the fear of dying with, uh, with cancer. Um, as a victim, I know what pain looks like because I suffered a lot for uh, <laughs> for 10 long years. I'm still suffering. So I went through this, like how my family will handle this issues or what will happen if I won't make it through this cancer um, and how long I live, I'm going to live. Uh, like this, there were a lot of questions in my mind going uh, through that time. So which made me get into a deep depression and sometimes um, I think now that it's still, it's still on, uh, so which I want to get right of it, hopefully I will do. So, so the same questions will go through the person who hears for the first time, if she or he is diagnosed with the cancer cells, the very moment he will create a mental stress on the patient, it will create a mental stress. Um, by thinking that same questions, cancer is a deadly. Uh, next, he will survive or not. And next, what will be the cost of the treatment? Who will support for this treatment? Will my family support or not? Um, do my husband or my wife or my children will love me? Um, and uh, and what about my neighbors and relatives? What they will think? after hearing this, I'm, I'm suffering from cancer. So uh, these are the things, these are the basic things uh, which a cancer patient deals with. Uh, it, takes, it takes them into a deep uh, depression or, uh, or, or they are being in uh, mental stress, something. So in most of the villages, the cancer patients and their family is considered as untouchable uh, in, uh, in India or uh, some says it is a communicable disease. If we go and uh, talk with the cancer patient or touch them, it will spread us uh, like uh, this coronavirus does. Uh, some says that it's a sin of a last birth. So because of this, most of family won't tell their uh, neighbors and relatives in India. And uh, Moreover, in some village hospital, like countryside hospital, they don't provide the therapist to the patients and to the family to deal with these problems. So it's clear that the mental health of the cancer patient and the family is not even considered in some hospitals of India, uh, which is which. Uh, the patient and the patients and family must need, uh, but nobody is at to talk about this. And the uh, next biggest issue a cancer patient deals with that family uh, is that the cost of the treatment, which is unimaginable and unbearable if they are economically poor background. Uh, most of families. The, the families which I saw, the patients which I saw, they most have sold their houses, their jewelries for the, to get to the best treatment uh, or to save their life. But, um, or if, if not, if not, they don't have house or um, jewelries, they ask for help in the bank or ask some relatives or friends. But in most cases, they won't get any help and left to die. And uh, which I saw, which I saw, it, it is happening in India. Sorry to say. Uh, mostly common, mostly in the uh, countryside. The, uh, so, where a woman who is not earning member of the family is diagnosed with a cancer, her in law family neglects her to die as they consider uh, based on putting all the savings or all the money to save her life and it's very casual 
they move on to the next uh, these are the common uh, issues for a, a mental depression on a cancer patient uh, which they deal every day so when i met uh, nitya for the first time uh, she was also she was also um, dealing with the same problem same issues uh, her husband uh, divorced her husband divorced when she when he got to know that she is having a uh, cancer um, and she and he left her with her 7 year old daughter to in her mother's house uh, so uh, that time she nitya didn't told her uh, husband uh, her mother that she was the only member in her family she did told her that uh, she is having a cancer uh, and she somehow uh, just the pain she didn't told any she didn't told uh, her mother uh, within a within a month her mother also passed uh, due to uh, diabetic attack uh, just uh, thinking or just her depression on depression on her uh, daughter's life just she was less 32 years old and her uh, da- granddaughter was 7 year old uh, so when uh, or uh, on two two three months after two three months when she uh, she can't bear the pain and she went to the hospital and uh, had the emergency uh, surgery uh, by selling her gold pension money her mother was working as a uh, sorry her mother was working as a sanitary worker uh, so she had some uh, pension amount her death amount so she um, used that for her surgery emergency surgery and had a two month uh, chemotherapy and after that uh, two month she didn't have any money left for further Uh, chemotherapy uh, so she decided not to go to hospital and uh, and there was no one in the family who will support her so she um, she was left alone at home so taking her up her uh, daughter uh, dropping her to school and picking her up uh, actually from her house to uh, that school was nearly 10 to 15 kilometers and she used to travel by bus uh, she didn't have any ma- money left over so when i met for the first time nitya uh, she was dealing with this things so i promised her whatever happens whatever happens i will be with her till the end um and somehow i managed uh, for the two chemo that uh, actually her uh, she has having that breast cancer and uh, the two months uh, gap made her that uh, cancer spreaded into uh, lungs and her bones and that was spreading uh, to her brain and uh, doctor told me that uh, she won't survive for uh, within a two or three weeks she, she won't survive then i made myself a promise that i want her to uh, live for her daughter because i was because i when i was in hospital i suffered a lot uh, i know the pain of losing Uh, daughter's uh, happiness or uh, seeing that daughter growing so i was uh, uh, very much in depressed so somehow i managed to come out so i wanted her to come out from that uh, cancer um, so me and my friend one of my one of my friend introduced me to that uh, popular tv channel and uh, from that we uh, helped her by giving uh, lifetime medicine free and her daughter uh, uh, till her finishes her uh, degree uh, the co- the education fees uh, will be free so uh, when nitya doesn't have anything like money or uh, nobody has that to support her except her 7 uh, year old she was in totally depressed mode she was in totally depressed she can't even eat she can't even walk she can't even think or uh, say anything to anybody uh, the pain uh, and the uh, oh. 
so when i did all this uh, she had a bank balance uh, very much a bank balance and she has to she has she doesn't have to worry about that her uh, treatments or her daughter's education or anything else because i was there supporting but still the depression came that uh, will i will she, will she survive she asked me what will i survive for my daughter and i said of course you made it uh, till two and a half years when doctor said it was two to three weeks you made it two and a half years then you can survive so that is that is you know, that is not a problem um, but unfortunately uh, in this covid uh, season uh, she couldn't uh, continue her, her uh, therapy uh, because uh, bus and because of transport and uh, emergency ambulance um, she skipped uh, one uh, chemo and uh, on may this month uh, this year she died so it feels very sad that a uh, patient uh, who which uh, which the patient with uh, the cancer which can be cured maybe it's not the 90 90% it can be cured but these kind of small small things depression uh, make some it's uncurable we think that it's uncurable and uh, everyone uh, makes uh, uh, bring that feels that uh, uh, it can't be cured it's a deadly disease uh, you are just going to live for uh, one or two months and you're nothing so this makes the patient very uh, depressed and i want and i actually wanted to share another uh, group of patients uh, which okay i've stopped sharing anita maybe try sharing your desktop i mean do share screen and in that but share can... your entire screen when you do it you you'll get a notification that says uh, share screen or just the folder so share your entire screen desktop share your entire desktop screen so can you see can you see yeah maybe try opening is it no i'm still not able no i'm still not able to see it photos so how to share can you see this uh, screen uh, yeah but i can see the folder not your screen so i think that is the problem we can see the thumbnails uh, anita can you just close this folder please okay i closed it okay now just share your screen again you've closed that photo folder right yeah 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 okay just share your screen again uh from this uh, zoom yes from zoom. yeah from the zoom share your screen and that time you'll get a prompt saying share your entire desktop screen can you see it no no i can't see anything here at the bottom of zoom there is the share screen button yeah you... yeah i saw that yeah can you ha. just press it yeah now you started screen sharing okay can you see this We yeah can see your desktop now okay Which folder do you want to open okay is it yeah. open just one sec yes now yes open. yeah what exactly yeah it. now we can see Yeah, so continue yeah so these are the other patients which i met in the hospital um uh, she is a uh, deaf and a dumb uh, she can't speak on she can't hear uh, but they were uh, uh, their marriage was love marriage and uh, she was just uh, 35 she was just 35 and she had a breast cancer uh, she couldn't convey her pain to her husband but somehow somehow he managed to understand and he brought her to this hospital where 
the treatment was highly co costly and uh, this man was working as a daily wage if he goes to work then only he has the money so somehow for a month and two months he supported uh, that chemotherapy and after that uh, he, he couldn't manage it so he left the hospital by um, by telling nobody just uh, just vanished from the hospital and i'm still searching after two years two to three years and uh, i'm not able to connect with them um, and she is a patient uh, with 45 she is a 45 and she has a uterus cancer her husband also or daily wages uh, he's a son um, something same like that uh, they can't handle that uh, cost of the treatment so they uh, she is also she was also taking a medicine one for a month and left it um, and uh, she uh, she was uh, 30 years uh, she was having that uterus uh, cancer um, The, her, hus her husband uh, brought her to the hospital for the treatment and the doctor said uh, she has to be here for uh, for the treatment for next one week or uh, two weeks uh, till the surgery finish or uh, till, the, till she get cures. So in between that he left her uh, wife here, he went there and he married another woman without telling uh, her, his wife and she was very shocked after hearing that news. And, uh, and and she asked why you married and leaving me in the hospital. And she, he told, uh, it's basically I can't provide, I can't help you by the amount uh, for the treatment. So I left. So something, this kind of patients still exist. Uh, she was she was diagnosed with a breast cancer. Uh, nobody was there to support from her family. She alone came to the hospital, uh, had a treatment, and uh, and was just alone in the hospital for further treatment. And I couldn't uh, follow her uh, further. And uh, she was 45 when she was diagnosed with cancer um, last year, 2018. Uh, she was diagnosed by cancer uh, two two months before she messaged me from the facebook she was she was my facebook follower and she messaged me that mm, i want to be like you uh, she calls me akka Mita akka uh, yeah, i want to be like you i want to be photographed uh, i want to learn photograph so will you teach me uh, then i said okay i'll teach you uh, let the time come you buy the camera we will see you and uh, we, for two months she was uh, shooting photographs from her mobile uh, and she always uh, sent me that mobile photographs and tell me that Aka, see this is this okay is this uh, nice or something she was asking so i used to uh, correct that photographs and uh, after two months i didn't have i didn't receive any messages from her or any call from her for past uh, six months so and then I suddenly uh, call. Uh, I got a call uh, on um, Diwali time uh, that uh, she is uh, suffering from breast cancer, and uh, uh, one side surgery has performed, and uh, she wants to meet me. Then that time I was out of station, uh, so I was I wasn't very sure that the woman who loves to photograph uh, is in this condition. So when I came back. Uh, uh, so I surprisingly visited her home uh, in Christmas. That time I brought some flowers and uh, some cakes and she was so surprised to see me. Uh, I can't explain that uh, emotional things. She was so happy. So, and uh, when I, and I, and I uh, um, so when I saw her on Christmas, she was in this condition. And within a month, in January, uh, she passed away. And uh, still, uh, 
I don't know how to face her, face that her daughters. Uh, they will. They also tell me that uh, Andy, uh, Mama is your fan. Uh, Mama likes to shoot like you. Uh, can you teach me what is the cameras? They always talk with me, and sometimes I feel very bad for this. It happened, and. Uh, she was 50 year old. She was diagnosed same with uh, breast cancer. Uh, she had three, two daughter and a son. Uh, her husband was working in a cinema line. He was a cameraman. Uh, that children's, uh, that uh, son and daughter were working in IT IT companies in Chennai, and uh, they left her. They threw her from the house and told that if you will be with my son and daughter, they will get infected. So you be go alone and stay in some other place that we will come and um, uh, help you like that. So from that day, she, is, she wasn't at home. And uh, three months back, she passed away uh, because of because she didn't get that treatment on the diet. And uh, here, he was a, uh, he is uh, just four year old. He had a spiny cancer. Uh, their family, her dad's, his dad's family, uh, actually, 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 they are also um, suffering with same problem, money problem. And uh, the hospital from, uh, Mother and Apollo Hospital is giving treat, uh, treatment for this uh, boy uh, for lifetime free treatment because of no idea. Anita, um, I'm sorry, um, you know, I understand what you're saying that you know there is a financial yeah. impact and there is, you know, there's already a Meant, uh, you know, psych uh, physical impact to these disease. Uh -huh. To that, it is very important that you know we are mentally prepared to deal with something like this. Uh, you know, keep science apart. No matter how much treatment you get, no matter what kind of doctors or you know facilities there are, a person's resistance to fight the disease also plays a huge role in you know, times like this, how much do you think that makes a difference for survivors like this, you know? You, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, Can I say like how much, like, you know, how you mentioned that, you know, the mental health of someone to fight this disease plays such mm -hmm. an important role. Mm -hmm. You yourself are a survivor. So when you see these uh, people, when you see the, hear about their stories, how do you think that has affected you? How do you think that has changed how you see them or how you speak to them or how you document these stories? So whenever I, uh, so first time when I met uh, Nitya, uh, I just uh, went and talked with her. And uh, I didn't uh, uh, take any photograph on that day, and I came back to Chennai uh, for a week. I was I was thinking that my 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 condition was that that I am again I started having that uh, cells in my in my body, and I can feel that. So it made me uh, depressed again. Um, so I went to the hospital. I treated myself. And I, uh, when when doctor told me that you are totally uh, negative uh, with the cells, so you can carry on whatever you do. Uh, that time I thought that it's a uh, mental, uh, it's a mental. Uh, it's a mental block type. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, that type of so. Uh, we should not, uh, if, uh, if anyone has this problem, should not uh, get stressed into this mental uh, things. 
so you have to be always positive and make that person to be a positive so that they can carry forward with that uh, yeah. statement or with that, that yeah a, a, a strong support system is what is more yeah. important it's, than it's the must. medical aspect of yeah. this disease it is most must and uh, in india we don't do that things we always see that what is a negative points of that uh, yeah. cancer how much money do we need to spend yeah. so how much time to, we need to give same same problem it always happens so we have to be always positive and make that person positive so whenever i meet uh, meet this kind of person i first make them positive and make them uh, relax that it is nothing it's going to be it's going to be fine so not to worry about this so i give them that hope of life yeah <laughs> that's wonderful to hear um just in the interest of time i'm going to move on to the next panelist yes. and uh, if you have questions if somebody has questions they can put it on the q and a box um so uh, uh, next uh, sorry to interrupt uh, sindhu yeah. was asking if it would be okay with shadman and you if she could go next uh, because you know her uh, medical condition so she was wondering if she could make the presentation now and then she can still participate but you know just go ahead yeah um, for me absolutely yeah. that's completely fine yeah thank you thank you great okay uh, so sindhu uh, sindhu is our next presenter she is a photographer from chennai she has been uh, documenting uh, the mental health conflict in kashmir so yeah over to you sindhu thank you thank you priya thank you suchi good evening everyone uh, i think it's uh, very interesting uh, for me to talk about my journey i am a photo journalist and i have been documenting human right violations gender equity environment sustainability issues i also have a dual career of sorts and in my other life i'm a psychologist and counselor and work in the wellness space so i think that's where i am been um interested in exploring the intersection between photography human rights and mental health so <clears throat> to start off with my work in kashmir and before that let me quickly share my screen okay you're we'll able to see it yeah okay so i first traveled to kashmir sometime in 2012 and back then uh, sindhu i can sorry i can just see the folder not the screen i think we're having the same trouble maybe oh. close the folder go to oh. your desktop screen and then Sure. Give me a second. Uh, 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 it should work now. Hopefully. Now. No. Yeah. Better. You can see it. Okay. Great. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so I first traveled to Kashmir in two thousand twelve or so, and and back then I was a travel photographer. and like anyone else i was enamored by the beauty of kashmir valley and when i kept going back and documenting various human rights issues i started observing how years of conflict and insurgency had left many generations and people across age groups afflicted with various mental health challenges and disorders so be it enforced disappearances extrajudicial killings economic instability unemployment drug abuse uh, the lockdowns more recently the stripping of statehood and the autonomous status i think all of this had pushed people to great trauma to give you an idea of how intense the challenge is there was a research that was done back in 2015 by imhans which said 1.8 million kashmiris have mental health challenges that's about 45% of them and one in five of them have had symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder and an average kashmiri was either experiencing or witnessing about seven traumatic events in their lifetime and unfortunately of all of this only 6% or so actually sought any kind of psychiatric help 
So I think um, when I went back to documenting, like I said, women, children, men, transgender people in various contexts, I started seeing the psychological impact of conflict. I started documenting how just like in different parts of India, the stigma and taboo around mental health issues and talking about it. And, and most importantly, the accessibility to mental health treatments and integration of it with, with overall health was a big challenge. I'm gonna start off with uh, first talking about women um, who are widows and half widows that I documented, and then go on to talk about the transgender people that I documented, two sets of them and what kind of mental health issues that all of them went through. So <clears throat> I first traveled to Dardpura, which is a border village just close to the line of control and later to Lola Valley. and. Dantapura has more than 250 half widows and overall Kashmir has about 20,000 widows and half widows. Let me take a minute to explain who half widows are. So these are women whose husbands have disappeared but have not been declared dead. So they could have crossed the border, they could have, they could have died in crossfire, they could be in jails. I think all of these women live in this constant state of ambiguity. In psychology, we call it ambiguous loss. There is no closure. There is no clarity. I remember some of them sharing how every time they would hear a knock on the door, they would go up excitedly hoping that it would be the husband that's back. So I think it's a huge uh, trauma that they had to live, live with. I remember uh, this lady, and I'm not taking names uh, to maintain anonymity, this lady was sharing how she had not slept peacefully even a single day since the disappearance. She would wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares, with constant visuals of her husband being killed or being in the jail. And most of these women are running pillar to post from jails to camps to find out where their husbands are. And of course, there is the whole unresolved uh, grief of not knowing where the husband is, but I think even culturally, socially, they're alienated. Economically, it's a huge challenge for them. Suddenly, they've become the sole breadwinner of the family. Uh, this is a lady who's lost her husband and her four sons. We actually see a collage of all of them. Some of them have died, some of them have disappeared. Her husband has disappeared. And they live, um, they financially, they have a huge burden pensions or ration card or banks, just opening bank accounts is difficult because they do not have death certificates. And of course, after seven years, you can still get a death certificate with and some ex-gratia payment, but they don't want to take it because it's blood money. So these are women who are constantly living with, uh, with grief and also are passing it on to their children. That brings us to half children. And these are kids who are growing up fatherless. They mostly do not have access to education. And some of them who have, then of course have, are going through unemployment and finding really difficult to get adjusted to the mainstream lives. And they grow up with a lot of angst and anger. Most of these women have huge <coughs> stress levels, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and so on. And none of them can afford psychiatric help. Traveling 150 kilometers from wherever they are to Srinagar, which is where Imhans is, it's really difficult for them to afford that. And even if they were able to afford the stigma in the society, the fear of being called mentally retarded, and that's a term that's still being used, uh, does not allow them to go seek that kind of help. So, Talking about children, so this is a person who lost his mom and his dad and his brother. And he's been speaking to the trees, he's been speaking to everyone around the village. And he believes every single person that he meets with is his father. He, his, his sister and brother, uh, they also live in uh, poverty and they cannot afford any kind of medical help. Now, some of them do go to peers, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, spiritual gurus of sorts uh, who do help, but that's the kind of psychiatric help they get. <clears throat> now, 
after I spent some time documenting all of them in the rural parts, I got back to Kashmir and met with Dr. Ashish Hussain, who is a um, professor, psychiatrist, head of the department. And he told me all about the journey of mental health in Kashmir. 20, 25 years back in 1990 or so, I think the hospital was still like a gutted mental asylum. People were chained, locked up. There were hardly one or two psychiatrists that were available. And there was huge stigma. People wouldn't go take up help. Compared to that now, I think there has been a lot of progress. There are about 30 to 40 mental health professionals there. But the OPD there in the Imhans Hospital, they have a footfall of 150 to 200 people every day. Uh, there is a lot of mainstreaming of mental health help. So we have uh, the women's hospital and the children's hospital having uh, wards for psychiatrists and counselors. So all of that has happened. I think the biggest challenge has been to make all of this available in rural parts, going beyond Srinagar to rest of the um, the rest of the state. <clears throat> Another population that I documented is that of the is that of transgender people in Kashmir. Now, I've been documenting transgender people across the country, and of course, a lot of challenges that they face are universal. I would say, but I think there is also a, a uniqueness to uh, transgender people in Kashmir. So, one, the only profession, or the biggest profession that they allowed to do is being men's I don't know, I'm pronouncing it right, matchmakers in weddings and singers and dancers and weddings. The picture that you see is that of Reshma, who's a very popular one. Um, and she's, she like anybody else has had a very difficult journey from being harassed and bullied in school, being harassed and bullied by army men and asked to dance in front of everyone, in front of a huge crowd without clothes to growing up in the conf in, in the peak of the conflict in the 90s, 2000, I think she's had a very, very difficult journey like most others. I think what's unique about uh, the, the challenges for this population is there is the identity of being a Kashmiri uh, and, and living with conflict <coughs> to that of being Muslim and the Islamic view of being transgender. And thirdly, that of, of course, their own gender identity and dysphoria and what they go through as they uh, hope to seek to transition and be with their community of sorts. So I think they have a very multi-layered and very complex kind of um, identity. And like elsewhere, I think it is the community support that keeps them going, but all of them go through huge depression, um, anxiety, and even suicidal tendencies. I think uh, something unique about Kashmir is you have to, families have to buy burial grounds, uh, land for burial ground, burial, burial. And since most transgender people have run away from their homes and are not integrated by their family, once they are dead, it's really difficult for them to find a graveyard. So if you listen to, uh, if you meet some of them, they'll tell you how they literally struggle to find space in the in the community graveyards and people don't allow that because they believe the transgender soul will affect the rest of them. And sexual violence, of course, is another aspect to the whole thing. <clears throat> A lot of them speak about how they have endured huge um, physical, sexual, mental harassment in, uh, in different contexts. The picture that you see here of Nisar, the, the one in the Maroon Kurta, who is a trans person from the 90s and he, is, uh, he lives in this crumpled old room that you see, this, this is a one room house that he lives on, which has no water, no electricity, and he does not and cannot dance in weddings anymore and has no form of livelihood. He believes, not believes, he fears that he is going to die here, orphaned and nobody will probably even find his body. Um, his only resort is, spirituality and I think that's where he seeks comfort. Some of them, a very few of them in fact, do find of course um, acceptance by family. Um, this is um, Ashwak who's found that and he you see him with his nephew and he is able to kind of integrate with mainstream and find the support from family and others to go through, uh, go through his life. But 
he also struggled with huge PTSD after losing a few friends from the community to suicide. So these are, of course, uh, two different populations I looked at to understand how mental health um, disorders affect people in Kashmir. And I think there is a huge psychological crisis and COVID has only made things even more difficult. And I hope to continue to, I think this is, this is a project I'll probably be documenting. I could document for the rest of my life. There's just so much to talk about, so much to bring to light, um, so much of awareness that needs to be built. And most importantly, a lot of work to break the stigma and the taboo around this, have more conversations on human rights-based approach to mental health. And as Kashmir is going through this transitional justice period, see how people in different contexts um, can be supported with mental health, um, supported through their mental health journey. Thank you. Do, do you think that, you know, uh, for people living in Kashmir, obviously there is this huge political crisis that is happening, you know, there's an economic crisis. Do you think these people are even aware of the problems that they're facing or, you know, sometimes uh, it takes a lot for a person to understand that, you know, I am going through something. This is affecting me psychologically. Do you think the people over there have this opportunity to speak about it, you know, to their family, to their friends? Sometimes not everybody might have access, like you said, to go to a hospital or see a psychiatrist. Do you think they are open to these conversations? They're very much aware. I think it's a battle that the entire community, unlike in the rest of the country, is going through. Right? Every second person has seen somebody very close to them die. They have seen friends going away from Kashmir. They have seen rampant un unemployment. They have seen lockdowns for months. They have lost all yeah. their education and finding jobs continue to be a huge thing. So they're surely aware and they know, and drug abuse, for instance, is, is a result of, and also it's both a consequence and a causative factor for, I think, mental health challenges. So they're very much aware. They're very much um, comfortable talking about it to their group of friends, maybe. Uh, to, to a few yeah. people that they, are, they, they trust and they want to open up. Trust, with. yeah. But I think the, the the taboo in the overall society is very similar to what it is in the rest of the country. You don't want to be seen by your neighbor uh, while you're walking up to the hospital, or you don't want to be seen as a weak person who can't handle it yourself. Handle it. Um, yeah. If you're a man, more so. I think women probably express a little more. I think as much at the risk of uh, making a stereotypical stereotype, but I think. Um, I was also told at the hospital they have far more women seeking help than men because they're more comfortable. So they all know that they're vulnerable, but they, I think the availability and accessibility is a huge challenge. Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of people might have many more questions later. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Next, I would like to invite Sh Shadman. Shadman is a photographer and filmmaker born and raised in Bangladesh. Uh, presently, he's in Netherlands practicing. Uh, his artistic uh, methodology walks the line between documentary and fiction. And um, his work that he's presenting today, No Quarter, is a story of a couple who have been in an abusive relationship for more than 20 years. Uh, over to you, Shadman. Uh -huh. Thank you, Priya. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me start by saying what a pleasure and honor it is to be given such a platform to express myself. Uh, I would like to thank Shuchi, Priya, and the entire CPB Learning Lab team for this opportunity. Um, as Priya said, my name is Shadman Shaheed. I'm a photographer and educator from Bangladesh. And in my country, 87% of the women suffer from one form of violence or the other. Uh, this is according to a survey done in 2011. Today, I would like to take on the role of a storyteller rather than an academic and share with you the story of Alo and Shagor. So uh, let me just see if I can share my screen. Is 
Is it visible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can. Okay, so I'm just going to turn off my camera while I share the screen. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my hope is that through this story, we'll be able to understand um, the various factors uh, that contribute to the toxic environment for mental health and wellness in Bangladesh. Uh, following is a docu-fictional story, but a true story told from the perspective of Alo, who has been in an abusive relationship with Shagor for almost three decades now. The names have been changed and the faces hidden to protect the identity of those involved. And I would just like to warn everyone that um, this presentation contains a lot of extremely violent words and imagery. So that, that might be something that you should be careful of. So the story goes as this. I was hidden from the rest of the world for months after my birth. My mother had given birth to two other beautiful daughters and no sons before me, which according to Bangladeshi societal standards at that time was an unforgivable unforgivable deficiency on her part. So she found it sensible to delay the ridicule and hurt she would surely face from her husband and everyone else by hiding me for as long as possible. My father was working in the city at that time. He had last seen his pregnant wife months ago and was now getting worried as there was no, use, no news from home for a while. He decided to go and check for himself and he found out that I was born. For a learned man like him, the whole situation of hiding the child because it wasn't a boy was hilarious. He picked me up when he saw me and gave me all the love he had inside him. I was an intelligent and curious child. I was lanky and small, but what I lacked in size was more than made up for with my courage and vigor. I spent my days role-playing characters from the Thundercats and spent nights worrying about who I can marry off my dolls to. I took apart the cassette players and put it back many times. I learned how to make a tiny fridge to store food for my dolls. I liked school as any good student would. Anyone with half a brain could see that I was destined for great things. When I was nine, I would visit my friends' weddings friends from my class, girls who were also nine. I found the husbands to be repulsive. They were old and hairy and looked like monsters. I never once wanted to get married to them or anyone like them. My father somehow understood that and he promised that he wouldn't marry me off before I was ready. During my teenage years, my father had to just move away from the family for work. I was still going to school, still as brilliant as ever. I still adored my dolls and tinkering with technology, but some things did change. I was attracting a lot of unwanted attention from boys and men. Most of the time, I knew how to handle them and I could definitely hold my own, but my parents were worried. There was, after all, no man in the house to protect me, and there was no telling what terrible things were going to happen. One day, a man came to visit the village I was living in at that time. I think he was visiting my neighbors. During his stay, he would stare at me from afar, seemingly observing my every move. But he never came up to me to talk or to do anything else but he stared. I wasn't frightened, but it didn't feel right. He left after a week and I decided to go over to my neighbors and ask about him. Who was he? Why was he staring at me the whole time he was there? They said that he found my personality fascinating. He enjoyed watching me do the housework and he thought that I was beautiful. They said he was an established man from the city from a good family, and he was only 30. I was 14 at that time. Some time went by 
and the strange man was out of my mind. I was getting ready for a feast at my uncle's house. I wore my sari and makeup per usual, but for some reason, my family forced me to wear more gold than necessary. I didn't think too much of it. When I reached there, all eyes were on me. Everyone cleared my path and I was led to a stage. By the time I realized what was happening, it was too late to take any actions. I simply sat and wept as my friends and family put turmeric on me. It was my guy holu, a pre-wedding ceremony. All the people there were gathered for me. And I was realizing all that just then and there on the stage. I also met my husband for the first time. He was the guy from my neighbor's house from a while back who had stared at me all summer without saying anything. I was to be married to that guy. I was 15 and he was 31 at the time. What happened was a few years, a few months earlier, the man had arrived with 200 kilograms of sweets and various gifts for my whole family and a proposal for marriage. The man met with my father and mother and expressed his admiration for me. I was not present at the meeting and I knew nothing of what was going on. My father had decided it was time for me to get married. It was becoming too risky for me to be left alone without a man's protection. To him, Shagar seemed like a decent man and good proposals were hard to come by. So my parents ha had decided that I was to be married, uh, but out of fear that I would reject the notion, no one told me their plans before I sat at the stage in my pre-wedding ceremony. I spent my wedding night in my own house with my new husband. I sat on the couch while he sat on the bed. He gently asked me to join him, but I refused. He didn't seem to be offended by my refusal, but instead spent the whole night talking to me, getting to know me better. We spent the night maintaining a distance that I deemed was appropriate. The next morning, he left for the city and I stayed back home. I was to join him a month later after he had arranged the necessities for me to live at his house. Over the next one month, we talked over the phone, but we didn't see each other at all. The talks were pleasant and mostly about our future. After a month, I left my father's house and I went to my husband's. My suitcase was mostly filled with the dolls that I made myself because I played with them every day. After unpacking, they showed me to my new room. There were three other men other than my husband lying in different positions in the room. I was taken aback when my husband casually mentioned to me that I'll be sharing my room with them. They were his brothers and cousins and now mine. I had to share and that was that. On that night, I didn't have a couch and a safe distance to protect me. I had to lay with him and he had sex with me with the brothers and cousins lying not two feet away from us. Like the whole day, I didn't think I had a choice to protest. So I just lay there weeping silently. For the longest time, I had to share my space with my brothers-in-laws. Till the time I got pregnant with our first child and the child was born, I was only 16. She was a beautiful baby girl. During that time, I took care of the child mostly by myself while Shagar was out. It wasn't something that was unexpected in a marriage. The mother takes care of a child and the father works for a living. That's how the society works. But it is a handful to take care of a child by yourself when you're just 16. One particular day, was especially challenging. My daughter was sick. She had a fever and diarrhea. At the same time, I got very sick too. I too was burning with fever. Despite that, I did my best all day. 
I wasn't sure where he had been and I didn't ask. I was just getting ready for bed after I had cleaned the baby when she started throwing up and crying again. I lost my temper a little bit and shook her and was about to clean her again when suddenly I felt a blinding pain at the back of my head. Shagor had kicked me with all his might and he kept kicking me. Then he pulled my hair and slammed my head against the floor. He started shouting at me and saying that I was not taking good care of the baby. The beating only stopped when he got tired. I spent that entire night on the balcony and I finished the whole pack of cigarettes that I stole from him. This was the first time anyone had ever laid a hand on me. The next day, there was no remorse on his part. He, spent a, see, he went about his business as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. I wanted to leave, but I was only 16 and my baby was just a month old, so I stayed. In the years that followed, it felt as if Shago had de developed a taste for abuse. A single day didn't go by where I was not verbally abused or psychologically tortured or beaten. When I was pregnant with our second child, Shago rejected the idea that the child was his. He believed that I had been unfaithful and slept with one of my cousins, and that's how I got pregnant. I was forced to get an abortion when the embryo was three and a half months old. After this incident, I was locked out from the outside world. In the first years, I was not allowed to step out of the house or interact with anyone other than my parents and siblings. I was pregnant with our child again, but this time, Shagor allowed me to have the child because he was more sure of my fidelity. It was another beautiful daughter. Between our second child and our third child, my life was pretty uneventful. My days were spent listening to verbal abuse and the nights were spent getting beaten up. I could never go back to my father or tell him too much about what was happening to me. In Bangladesh, divorce was not socially accepted at that time and it could be devastating to my children's social life. So I decided to stay, to endure for the sake of my daughters so that someday they can have a chance of getting married and have a happy life. The day my father died, I was devastated. The loss of someone who loved me the most in this world was unbearable. My whole world was falling apart, but I didn't know where to look for a consolation. After the funeral, I went back to Shagor's house and to my surprise, his whole family was present there. I had not expected them to show, any, show me any kind of support. So I, pleasant, I was pleasantly surprised, but the family was not there to support me. Instead, they were there to be judges to an accusation Chagor had made about me. He said that I was having an affair with the pharmacist at the hospital where my father passed away. I sat there numb, still recovering from my father's death as they took turns shaming me. After all was said and done, I stood up, went to the toilet and gobbled down a litter of disinfectant. Shagor's family didn't let me die because they feared a police case. After my recovery, I was thrown out of the house. My husband beat me up, dragged me by the hair and threw me out of the house. I cried for my children, but he did not let me take them. My father was dead. My mother would not take me back. So I sought refuge in the house of my aunt. I contemplated suicide many times, but I couldn't take my own life in the hopes that I may see my children again. But self-mutilation became a daily habit. One of my favorite things to do was to take a syringe and pull the blood out of my body. Then I would spray the walls with that blood. It gave me a strange sense of satisfaction. Sometimes I felt if I was uglier, I would be less miserable. 
Shago wouldn't suspect me and we would live a happier life. So I would smash my own face against the wall, deforming it in the process. One day while I was out shopping for groceries, I was kidnapped. A group of men pulled me down from my rickshaw, blindfolded me and took me to an empty garage. The men were gangsters from my husband's neighborhood and brought and had brought me to the gar gar garage to find out if I was a morally corrected woman. Shago didn't send them. They came of their own accord when they noticed that I was not living with my husband. They thought it was bad for the neighborhood's image and they would have none of it. They asked me questions mostly regarding my marriage and my relationships with my husband. After the interrogation, they decided that I was innocent and let me go. They also decided that my husband was in the wrong in throwing me out. So it was their duty to go back to Shagor and make him aware of his mistakes. They asked him to do the right thing and take me back. A few days later, I went back to Shagor and most importantly, my daughters. During my time away, my husband had been having an affair with the maid. This was not the first time he was unfaithful. There was the actress, the one who later died of cancer, and now this, the maid. But once I was there, the maid had to go, and I got my family back. Things didn't change much from what it was before. There was no remorse from his part, and no apologies were given. But my daughters were a bit older, and they would protest on my behalf whenever he tried to abuse me. All of a sudden, there were three of us. So the abuse became less frequent. It completely stopped after a fourth child was born. It was a baby boy. Nowadays, I don't have to face physical abuse anymore. I still face neglect and lovelessness though. But for me, it doesn't even compare to what it was before. I often see our dead daughter, the one I had to abort, playing around the house during my waking hours. A pair of eyes in the sky always follows me whenever I step out of the house. When I sit down to pray, a pair of hairy legs wraps around me, rendering me motionless. But none of these monsters scare me as much as my lover does. This is my first daughter. A few weeks ago, I tried to beat her up and force her to marry someone she not, did not want to marry. But eventually she escaped, but that's a story for another time. Thank you. That, that was it. Thank you, Shadman, for sharing that with us. I just, uh, I, I have a question. How did you meet Alo? Like, what made you keep going back and you know, saying this, narrating the story for her. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid if I say too much about how I met her, it might give away part of her identity. Okay. But the process of meeting her was, was not very quick. I, I would say I started doing this project because like everyone else in Bangladesh, I was also affected by violence against women uh, deeply. Um, because we all have women in our family. To be honest, I, I was raised by women. Uh, my father, bless his soul, was a really good father, but I was always surrounded by women and, and they have been uh, my role models. But you, when you see your family members being affected by it, you also get deeply affected by it. So I wanted to do a story on violence against women. Um, and for me, initially, it was more about finding as many uh, cases as I could. And it was a very kind of broad kind of story that I was telling and which didn't work out for me. And then maybe I can tell you a little bit. This person is actually one of my family members or family friends, I wouldn't say what. Um, so she's part of the family and I, um, yeah, I got to know her story. And this is something uh, that I thought 
maybe I should just tell one story and, and through that, maybe you can also understand better the millions of, 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 of the same thing that, that's happening to others. Um, uh, so that's, that's how we started speaking. And I was really concerned about if I was morally or ethically doing the right thing or not at that time. Um, that, that was something that, that kept bugging me, but um, she, she was very happy sharing her story, which gave me kind of a permission to tell this story. She wanted to tell the story. She didn't want to share her name or her face, but she really, she had written diaries in the hopes that someday it will be published, but she, she wanted her story to be told. Um, yeah. So I think that kind of gave me a permission to, to speak about her. Um, yeah. I see that most of the images that you have used in this narration are from her family album. Was that intentional or, or that she didn't, did you not want to stage new pictures or what was the... Actually, it's, it's, it's uh, interesting that you say that uh, because it's not actually, uh, most of the pictures are from her family album. I wanted to create images or recreate the images in such a way that it looked like it is from a family album. Okay. Um, the whole point was to do That's that. Interesting. Yeah. So there's this. Uh, th there are pictures from the family album. There are uh, straightforward documentary images, but there's also recreated images of her also acting there and other actors acting there. So it's a mixture. Yeah. That that, that is you. You really can't tell that when you take a look at this vision the first time. Yeah. Okay, um, I think um, I'm going to open the panel now. Uh, maybe if anybody from the panelists has questions for each other, and then I can ask some, some open questions. Yeah. Okay, um, okay, if um, nobody has, uh, I have a question for, this is an open question, anybody can take it. I know a lot of you uh, have been documenting these things and say, you know, it, maybe if somebody sees this, they are inspired by it, they feel connected to it, or, you know, you want to bring awareness to it. And I know Mithil has mentioned that this is like a journal for him, but for the rest of you, what do you hope to achieve? Like, what do you think this work is going to help you? Like, how do you think this is going to make a difference to you? Maybe Salgo can start, yeah? Um, I mean, I'll just echo again what I said before, um, you know, photographing, this project about gender dysphoria, you know, really sheds a light onto this issue that not, not everyone knows about and is aware of. So it definitely will allow not just people to see their own stories and relate to it, but other people to learn from it. And, um, you know, I think for me personally, you know, since um, I am part of the LGBT community, then it allows me to connect with other people in the community. And, um, and so by doing that, you know, I learn a lot too. And as I get to hear these stories and, um, and share them with other people. So the form of, I guess, connection. Um, yeah. Sindhu, uh, do you want to share your thoughts on this? Sure. I think not just Kashmir, every, every story that you document, every person that you meet um, who's gone through severe human rights violation situations, you learn a lot about um, hope and courage and persistence and fortitude and how they are building resilience, how despite those challenging situations, they go through life with so much of strength. And I think you draw, I draw from that and it helps my uh, it helps my mental uh, well-being is what I would say. I think it's 
uh, we call it restorative journalism, right? Instead of just focusing on what's going wrong, you focus on how people go through that tough challenge and come out of it. And, and the learning from that is immense. And Kashmir especially, I think, it's, it's impossible for me to say I empathize with you to anyone there. I think yeah. it's a very, very, very unique, uh, um, unique subject. And every single person I meet, I learn so much about a different world. And yet there is so much of connection and similarity to what we go through as people. I think that's, that's been my takeaway. So um, uh, I don't know if Anita mentioned this. Uh, she is currently taking care of uh, Nitya's daughter. Nitya passed away in May last this year, and uh, she is uh, taking. You know, she is the primary caregiver for her daughter. So, you know, when you talk to these people, when you document these stories, where do you think the boundary lies between just being a bystander or an observer and becoming an active participant in their life? You know, how do you, you know, stop yourself from going beyond what you just have to do, beyond just telling their story? Anita, do you want to take this? Yeah, yeah. Anita? Yes. Yeah, so my question is, you know, where do you draw the line between just telling their story and, you know, seeing them and meeting them and talking to them and actually actively participating in their life when you talk to these people? Uh, I, I don't, actually, I don't draw any line or anything uh, like that. I just... Uh, I just uh, be the uh, part of life or not part of life. So I travel with. Sorry, them. Anita, I can't hear you properly. Can you speak closer to the mic? Yeah. Can, can you hear? Uh, it's still a little low, the volume. Can you hear me? Can you? Hello? Hello? Can you yeah, hear? yeah, yeah. Now it's better. So I, uh, I actually, uh, I'm a little bit disturbed now. So uh, I actually, uh, they, are, they are like my uh, family members. So I don't, uh, I don't uh, say that. Something like that. Uh, she is. She was like my. Uh, she is actually. She used to tell me that uh, I am like her mother, and uh, so because of that, I was taking care of her uh, totally. So as she wished that uh, I have to take care of her daughter also, so I'm taking. So I don't find any boundaries or anything uh, to make them uh, be like our own part of life. So I think that is a um, uh, We have some questions from the audience that I'm just going to take. Um, this is a question for Mithul. In the past, have you had experiences where you noticed that the diagnostic label of bipolar disorder changed your reputation and altered the way other people treated you as an individual? It's an anonymous question. Uh, I mean, I would have to say yes, definitely. And uh, I wouldn't even say in the past. Uh, in fact, I don't know because this is probably the first time I'm sharing this work publicly. I don't know how people who have seen this work today and who have, I haven't had a chat about this are going to react tomorrow. Uh, but I wouldn't want to put the onus on the person uh, sort of changing their behavior, tempering their behavior now that they know this part of me. Because uh, I would put the onus on the larger unawareness that we have of what mental health uh, society. I think it needs to be really normalized where 
I need to be, or anyone needs to be comfortable talking about, uh, I am feeling really low today as, as easily as someone would say, I am, I have a fever today. I think that is what I would uh, hope that we reach soon. Um, I hope that answers their question. Uh, Shatman, uh, this question is for you. Uh, yeah. I think you've answered this, but uh, just curious, why have you painted or designed the faces of the characters in some of the photos? Well, uh, it's to protect their identity, really. Um, but it was for me aesthetically why I chose this is because it's from um, a wedding. I, I don't know how to say it in English. It's it's like a mandala, um, like a design that you do in, in, in weddings. Um, that's the design. But I also needed to see their eyes in the images. So I could not completely make the uh, faces um, black or I don't know, put a circle around it or completely invisible because the expressions were important. But at the same time, I, I wanted to protect their um, identity. So I think all of those things put together that that led me to the decision to hide their faces with this kind of design. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, a question for Sindhu. Um, in what way have the people you photograph contributed to the storytelling process? Uh, sorry, I'm a little confused. How have they contributed? How have the people that you have spoken to, like, okay. How have they contributed to the way you set their story? Or was it your understanding of the story? Okay. okay. I think it's mostly mostly their words. Um, but for um, me seeing a pattern over a period of time, when I probably went there the first time and I was meeting a half-widow for the first time, I'm also just understanding the story but as you keep meeting many more people as you understand the the politics of it the social culture milieu of Kashmir um, and you you are in situations where like I was in a stone pelting I was in lockdowns myself and I found it difficult to get to the airport once so when you go through all of that you also in the first hand sometimes experience I mean in a very very minuscule manner of course but I think over a period of time you become more and more sensitive, you understand a little more, and you start seeing patterns of how people in certain age groups talk about uh, mental health, or who is more open to seeking help, or what kind of um, support, community support uh, certain people in Srinagar have the service in rural parts. I think that's probably what I'm learning, but otherwise it's mostly I'm just telling their story as an onlooker uh, and I'm trying my best not to add my own judgments to it. Um, um, we have uh, one more question. I think uh, this will this is a good question to end this discussion on. Um, how do you take care of your own mental health? This is I think this is a very important question to ask everybody. Uh, how do you take care of your own mental health when you work with people like this? Like, you know, when you're trying to say other people's stories, how do you make sure, how do you make sure that, you know, not say protected, but how you are, say, uh, I would say protected, yeah. How do you take care of yourself, basically? If this, I'm just opening it up, anybody can answer. I think that's a very good question. And it's very important for us to think about that as well. Um, it's, it's for me personally, I, I think sometimes it can get very, very difficult to deal with, uh, with issues if, if, you, if you become too attached to, to the story or if you, start, um, if you start living the story, I, I guess, through them. It, it can become difficult, but I think it's more difficult to stay passive and not say anything or not do anything. I think it 
if if uh, more than anything, I think it helps the maker's mental health to be actively trying to question the situation or find so try to find solutions or trying to find stories. It's uh, it's not easy, but it's much better than staying passive, in my opinion. I think. I think I would second that. Most of these documentations for me has actually helped helped me draw courage from their own uh, lives. But also, I think the bigger challenge for me, and I do not know if others have felt that, is for me to sometimes stay detached. Um, <clears throat> I remember in the beginning when I would document uh, human rights issues and I would break down, I would cry, and I even have had people who I'm photographing come and pacify me. And I would feel guilty that this person has to do it. But fast forward 10 years, I'm so detached, I'm able to come back and watch a movie. And I would sometimes hate that about it, right? I, I have built the skill of being detached, which is essential to document. But at the same time, you wonder if you've become too thick skinned to let it affect you. So I think that's the, that's the constant battle in my head. How do I stay passionate about it and still be detached enough to be able to continue this work for a long period of time? Absolutely, that's so true, yeah. Mithil, do you want to take this because your work that you shared with us today is more personal. So how, do you see this as a body of work or do you see this as just something that you're doing that's a part of your life, you know? Do you remain objective or subjective at times? Uh, I think this question becomes relevant for me, not while I'm photographing, but I think when I am about to share this, uh, even privately, that is when this uh, question sort of comes into my being of how do I take care of, you know, because I'm, I'm putting myself out there, I'm sharing my vulnerability out there with maybe sometimes people I am comfortable with, but sometimes maybe people I'm not comfortable with. So, it is a constant question and I believe it still will remain a constant question as and when I, a situation like this arises. If that answers your question. In some ways, I think to be able to empathize or, or understand someone's work, it takes time, I think. I mean, that's all I would say. Uh, I think that concludes our panel for today. Um, I would just like to say thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and uh, as, uh, I would also like to thank uh, Shuchi and uh, other team member who's not here today, Kisha. Both of them have helped me a lot with this curation. Uh, some of them know each other, and Salgo's uh, studied with Kisha. And yeah, I, this, I think, was a very important conversation that we needed to have. And you know, especially at this time, and yeah. Uh, also, I would like to tell you all as part of a curation, we're also doing a series of film screenings. Uh, the details for that uh, is on our uh, Instagram handle. Uh, the link is mentioned in the chat box if anybody would like to sign up. Uh, we're doing a series of short films, and yeah. Um, also. Uh, yeah, I think just thank you to everyone who has, you know, joined us and supported us. And uh, yeah, it is great. Just great chatting with you all. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, please, please feel free to um, donate to us or contribute to us in any way. We are also opening our memberships. All details uh, are available on our uh, website. Uh, even that link is mentioned in the chat box. So, yeah, we hope to connect with uh, you all very soon and maybe see you at the festival. Yeah, thank you. Thank good night, you. everybody. You. Have a good day to people who are woken up early morning. Thank you, Salgo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Everyone, good night. Bye.